why it's a fight worth fighting. Uh, we have uh, some amazing guests today. We have our experts, um, Emma Schleppi from um, Lotze Razem, which is uh, like a Polish left youth organization, and uh, Kelly Crawley uh, from uh, Ireland, uh, from uh, Ogra Sinn Féin. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, Ke uh, I'm Katie uh, from uh, Links Youth Solid, um, which is the German left youth organization. Um, and uh, yeah, today we want to have uh, a little talk about reproductive rights um, in uh, Europe and um, the strategies uh, that we uh, might need uh, to uh, gain more rights um, on that matter. Um, yeah, Emma, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, hi, my name is Emma Schleppi. I am 16 years old. I, I come from a small city of Krosno in Poland. Uh, I'm the coordinator of the Lower Carpathia region of Mordirazem. I am very happy to be here uh, to discuss with you about uh, uh, fundamental uh, rights of women. Uh, I am very happy to be here. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're very happy to have your expertise today. And uh, what about you, Kelly? Um, could you also tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm a member of Ogre, Ogre Sinn Féin and I've been a member of the party, I'd say, six years. Um, and I used to work at Amnesty International before that and one of our campaigns was repealing the Eighth Amendment, which was against really abortion. And um, that's where I actually started off kind of with human rights and things like that. Um, and that got like bigger and bigger. So, you know, I'm really glad to be here as well because I know what it's like, you know, when I'm listening to what's happening in Poland, like Ireland was there not long ago, you know, and um, we still have a lot to deal with. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're very interested in hearing more about your campaign uh, as we go on with the seminar. Um, yeah, so um, at first we just want to kick off this seminar with um, a little bit of an introduction. We're also interested uh, in our participants. Um, Maxi, if you could send us the Mentimeter. Um, exactly, thank you. So under this link, uh, you will find a little survey that is asking you where you're from and we would love if every participant could fill it out because um, we're very interested uh, in uh, seeing um, who we're talking with today and who we are discussing with today we will publish the um, uh, the results of this um, Mentimeter survey in in a few minutes um, and uh, while we wait on the results, maybe some of the um, participants would also like to introduce themselves or tell us why they picked the seminar, what they're interested in. Um, if you want to ask for the floor, you can just um, send a message uh, into the chat um, if you would also like to introduce yourself. Okay, Maxi, in case you're sharing your screen, we cannot see it yet. Maxi is uh, helping me a little just, bit today. Just, uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at multitasking. Uh, now uh, we can share the screen. Uh, just wait a bit. Are you ready? Yes. Normally you should see it now. Do you see it? Ah, okay, so I see it. So I see we're mainly uh, from... Oh. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So I see we're mainly from uh, Central Europe. We have some Germany there. That's probably us, Maxi. Uh, then Spain uh, and what's that down there? Italy. Okay. And we have a pin that's a bit more outward. Um, okay, I think there are no islands there. Uh, yeah, I don't think anybody really lives there. It's probably a mistake, but still very interesting to see. Thank you for participating. Um, so today we wanted to talk about a little bit about reproductive rights and we want to um, first, um, uh, we would love uh, to hear a little bit about um, the current situation, um, the current uh, legislation um, from our two experts. Um, so why don't we start with you, Emma? Um, what can you tell us about the current situation 
um, regarding abortion rights and reproductive rights in Poland. So before we start about, uh, sorry, before um, before we start talking about what is now, uh, I think uh, we should um, kind of bring the topic of how it happened. Until 2020, abortion in Poland was accessible during only three circumstances: circumstances, rape or incest, uh, the fetus being a danger to the mother's health or when the fetus had any sort of fatal uh, illnesses or deformations. Uh, even then, Poland's uh, abortion laws were one of the strictest in the EU, with clinics being pretty much inaccessible. For example, in my region, there isn't even one clinic uh, that provides that sort of, uh, that sort of treatment. Uh, and miscarriages were being investigated by the police. There was an attempt to delegalize abortion in 2016, right after the far-right party peace was brought to power. Um, that started like the first wave of the fight for women's rights in Poland during the black protests in 2016. Um, again, the um, fight for women's rights was brought back in 2020 when um, the far-right government again wanted to take away the third, um, our right to have an abortion. They wanted to delegalize abortion during the third circumstance, which was a fatal uh, uh, fetus illness. For example, um, when um, the fetus didn't have, didn't have a brain or uh, didn't have the skills and organs to survive outside the woman's body. Um, um, a fact about it that the third circumstance uh, was about 98, 98% of all abortions in Poland provided. So when the government uh, wanted to delegalize that third circumstance, it basically meant uh, being it illegal for most women that wanted to have an abortion. Um, of course, um, that sort of uh, law wouldn't be passed from the uh, from the Polish parliament. So what the um, government did was uh, take the legislation to the constitutional convention, which even though on paper it's said to be a mostly, um, mostly non-government, non non-peace party, uh, um, non-peace party, most of the members were still um, members of peace or were associated with the party. So when uh, so when the law was brought uh, to the constitutional convention, it of course got passed as being um, as abortion because of uh, the fetus not being able to survive outside the body was and the voting is by the constitutional convention was against the constitution. Mm, that of course um, brought, as we all know, another a way bigger wave of protest in Poland uh, that has been going on for a few months. Uh, right after, a year after um, the law was, um, the, the law was meant to take place, uh, the Constitutional Convention has deemed it illegal. And right now, uh, doctors that have provided uh, abortions for women are sought after by the police, miscarriages are also investigated by the police. Women cannot abort uh, a fetus in Poland mo most of the time. Uh, right now, when a woman wants to have an abortion, we either have to go to a different country, mostly like Germany, Slovakia, Czechia, uh, are providing clinics for uh, women from Poland. And the Polish government is also fighting against that. 
uh, when the Polish government has asked Slovakia not to help women from Poland that want to have an abortion. Uh, even though uh, the fight for abortion rights in Poland has been um, pretty sad, to be honest, it has also brought, especially um, the protests in autumn in 2020, uh, have brought kind of a new light to the discussion about women's rights. Right now, it is spoken about more freely. Uh, more politicians want to um, um, bring back legal abortion for all, uh, but it just cannot happen under um, under the ruling party, which is um, very right wing, very conservative, and has always wanted to keep the uh, compromise uh, of abortion or even make abortion completely illegal. And when it comes to reproductive rights. Here also, we are fighting a very difficult fight mm. when it comes to, um, for example, um, pills. Uh, they are not widely accessible. You have to get a note from the doctor that you can buy them from the pharmacy. And even if you, and even if you have that note, uh, the pharmacist, uh, by law, is, uh, can refuse to sell you the, pi the pills because of something uh, called, um, basically, uh, the pharmacist or the doctor can refuse to give you, um, for example, a pill because it is against their religion, um, which has, uh, unfortunately, um, made um, a lot harder for women uh, to get treatment from miscarriages or after pills. Um, because of that, the fight for um, just normal human reproductive rights is a lot harder. We just have around a lot of stigma, a lot of religious st stigma, um, the government being very intertwined with religion, with the Catholic Church, uh, which is a very hard fight. Yeah, thank you for the um, for those insights. Um, and yeah, I mean, okay, abortion is um, highly legalized in Poland, um, and still about 80,000 to 200,000 women a year um, do uh, opt for a illegal abortion in Poland, nevertheless, and as you said, um, sometimes have to travel to other countries. Um, it sounds pretty familiar uh, for a lot of Irish women, I can imagine. Um, Kelly, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, like it, it is very similar what you were saying, especially with the Catholic Church, like Ireland was tied with that for so, so long, and we you know, it got, like, the history of it, like, is so long, like, um, abortion became legal in America, and they got afraid here that everyone was going to start having them, so they introduced the Eighth Amendment to, for, and they inserted the, for the life of the unborn, so that really just said, you know, there was no abortions legal here, um, but that kind of ended up being everyone, like, a lot of women went to England to get abortions, um, and, it, it basically then led to, you know, a, a numerous, like, people going to, to, to the courts. Like, it actually just ended up there. Um, and, like, one case, it was, like, in, the, in 1992 when a girl um, travelled over to England and then they found out and they basically were saying what you done was illegal. So that went to the courts. And then it, then it came out that people were allowed to travel to England um, in cases of, like, rape or things like that. Um, but like that still, that still didn't stop, you know, the Eighth Amendment from affecting women. Um, I think the big thing that happened here was when Savita, um, she basically went to hospital and they told her that if she didn't um, have an abortion, her, she and the baby would die. And they basically said, you know, you're in a Catholic country, you, you can't have an abortion. And the two of them died. Um, and like the whole country was an uproar because of that. Um, and, you know, that just led to more 
uh, protests as well, like you were saying in Poland. Um, so they, they eventually did change the law in 2013. They put in, um, if you're uh, raped or the uh, fetal, um, there's something wrong. Um, but that wasn't like good enough because there was so many like uh, difficult rules to go by that, you know, um, and it didn't really, like people were still traveling to England, like, you know, people that didn't want to say that they, you know, they were even pregnant. Like there was just no way for a woman, like in any way that that was anyway safe, I suppose. And like, because of the, um, the border we have here as well, people were going up there and it was really, really dangerous. Um, and like doctors here just wouldn't, they, they wouldn't like listen to people. Um, but then when that, when that happened with Savita, it was, basically more protests, things like that. And then it led to a citizens assembly um, and they recommended um, a referendum. And they had a referendum before, but that failed like, and it was it was just more all about, you know, life of the unborn, things like that. But there was no, like the, in 2018, when we had the referendum, it was all about choice in the matter. Like that's what, like there was no choice for any woman, like to have an abortion. And that's what it was about. Like it wasn't about, saying, oh, you know, abortions are, are going to be, you know, legal forever. You know, that's the way some of the other people were trying to portray it, or religious people. Um, but no, it was about a choice in the matter. And I think when people started to, you know, other people that would have been against it started to understand that it was um, a lot easier for the, the country to go, to go behind, I think, women's rights. Um, but like, you know, as we had the problem then with the North as well, they they eventually it got passed in Westminster that um, abortion was legal. Like it was just crazy that even in the North they had to keep tra like traveling to England. Like it didn't make any sense. Um, but now that we have it here, like, like there's still, um, it's up to twelve weeks now. Um, or in other cases, um, but like some doctors can refuse it. Like there's not really like a like if I was to even try and see how do I do that now it's kind of still difficult you know um I just still feel like there's still um a lot of stigma and a lot of you know it's because of what happened you know with the church years ago it's still difficult um so that's what that's like good that I'm like I feel like that a lot of European countries can you know if we can get behind this together you know um to have like a coherent you know, argument, but I think like the choice thing was really what drove it here anyway. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Um, so uh, just just to be clear, so in, in Ireland under the um, Eighth Amendment, um, abortion was restric restricted to only two cases where um, uh, it was a result of a medical intervention and performed to save the life of a woman, right? Yeah, it, like that was, at, that wasn't the case at the start because Savita ended up dying because of that. When in 2013 they made new legislation, which then said that they could do that. Um, but then, as I was saying, there were still people going over to England to get abortions, like anyway, because if you went to the doctor, you could maybe get refused. Um, you know, there was a lot of like if a woman was suicidal, they still had to prove, you know, a lot of things like so it didn't it wasn't really good enough. So that's because the amendment was still there in 2013. So without the removement of that, I don't think anything would have actually worked. Yes, and you mentioned the case of um, Savita uh, Halepanabar, mm -hmm. um, who um, like what, what do you think? How did this case change um, the um, public opinion? Because uh, if we look at the polls um, in 2013, 37% um, of people in Ireland um, thought that abortion should be provided uh, when a woman deems it to be her best interest. Uh, and then in 2018, in, in of course, um, the referendum was very successful with 66% um, of people in favour. How do you think that case um, played a role in that um, change of public opinion? I think by her, you know, a, like a, the death of two, like her baby and herself was just massive. Like it was just horrific. Like there was no need for you know it had to go that bad for people to start dying do you know what I mean and like it was just public opinion was just was just gone from that from that moment um 
and it's horrible that it has to take like something like that to happen you're you know um and there was I, there was actually there was a, a few more cases after that that like it ended up in courts i'd say a good few times even after that um which i think a lot of women were suicidal um as well yes and i've read that um being suicidal is also um, deemed as a threat to a woman's life um, yeah. and that there has been some discussion about that, whether that should be um, a, um, a viable cause to, uh, yeah, to, to have an abortion or not. Um, yeah, so you also mentioned the Catholic um, Church and uh, in, the, in the referendum, um, especially uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so you mentioned the Catholic Church, which is also um, obviously very important in Poland. Um, Emma, what do you think um, the, the Catholic Church has to do with um, the current uh, rollback in, in Poland? Well, the Catholic Church has always uh, been very intertwined with the government since the fall of communism even. Um, of course, uh, when uh, the Catholic Church is intertwined and has uh, a lot of strings attached to the government, of course, they have a lot of um, power over politicians. Uh, when um, politicians are on their knees before the bishop, we know that uh, there aren't necessarily very um, um, they are necessarily uh, very independent from the Catholic Church when um, they just do what the Catholic Church say, says. When the Catholic Church says that abortion is wrong, then the, then the ruling party says that abortion is wrong, even though some politicians from the ruling party don't necessarily think that. Uh, when the Catholic Church has a lot of input, not even in uh, Polish politics, but also just in the Polish media and the Polish uh, social life. When a person is pregnant uh, and, for example, the pregnancy has been uh, conceived by, for example, rape, and they go to the church and the bishop says that even when it's rape, uh, then the abortion is wrong and when you abort it you, you are a sinner then there's a lot of stigma mostly because of the catholic church um, around abortion about sex around uh, sex education about everything that seems progressive and normal for example in germany even or uh, in more progressive countries um, and the Catholic Church, of course, um, even during the protests, has been very active when the protests were held um, for abortion rights, for the rights of the LGBTQ community. Uh, the bishops of the country said uh, that um, devils are on the street, that uh, uh, rainbow plague is on the street. Uh, when there were circumstances when churches uh, when churches were um, maybe not devastated, there were, for example, bottles of paint were for thrown at the church, or um, or um, like uh, transparent of uh, pro-choice uh, statements were left by the church. They were deemed a devastation, a hate crime on the church. Um, when we want to talk about abortion rights and reproductive rights in Poland, uh, the Catholic Church is in a lot of the discussions. Uh, if it weren't for the Catholic Church, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that uh, the stigma and um, overall uh, the discussion uh, over abortion rights would be a lot easier and non-biased when we listen to uh, for example on the one side doctors and scientists and on the other side we have the bishops priests who are mostly just 
old men who just want to have a say over a woman's body. So, yeah, the Catholic Church and overall church uh, have been most of the time um, behind a lot of stigma and um, just um, why it's been hard to fight the fight for reproductive rights in Poland and um, the bias uh, in Polish politics in favor for the church are mostly why LGBT rights, women's rights are being prosecuted in Poland. Mm, thank you, Emma. So you've mentioned that um, bishops and the Catholic and uh, different Catholic groups pressured the governing um, Law and Justice Party to impose like a stricter law. And I've noticed that this um, debate uh, seemed to have come up in 2015. Um, uh, what, what do you think changed in that time? Why did that um, debate to have stricter uh, abortion laws uh, come up in 2015? Because if you look at the history um, of um, Poland, of course, it has always had strict abortion laws. Um, but, um, for example, in 1997 or uh, up until um, 1993, it did have um, a, a bit of... Um, you know, it, they weren't quite as tight. Um, what do you think changed in 2015 that made this debate possible? Well, um, in 2015, uh, the ruling party was put into power uh, right after the more liberal party. Um, of course, when a right-wing party comes to power, uh, a lot of right-wing politicians say, um, what they want to change in the country. And that's when uh, PIS at first started talking about um, tightening abortion laws, uh, about being more obedient towards the Catholic Church, about uh, Catholic values, about uh, the values of a traditional family. Um, that's when um, the um, public um, discussion first landed more on women's rights, about abortion rights. And when in 2016, uh, PIS wanted for the first time to tighten these rights, to um, take away the third circumstance when we could uh, have an abortion, which is um, fatal, um, which is uh, when the fetus couldn't live outside the body, um, when it just would die right after birth. The um, the leader of the ruling party, Jarosław Kaczyński, said that even when the child dies right after birth, it still it uh, will st st still needs to be birthed, baptized, and buried, which of course says a lot uh, still about the um, Catholic and um, the Catholic input that the church has on um, the ruling party, that the child needs to be baptized and buried, which also brings money to the Catholic church because of course, um, baptism costs, um, burial costs a lot, even when it's a um, fetus. Um, so it's not only sort of an ideological battle, but it's just, it's just a battle that we have fought for years. And uh, in 2015 and right now in 2021, there are the same old men and the same old bishops that want to take away our rights in, in the name of their values, in their religion and in their interests. Yeah, um, thank you, Emma. So, um, Kelly, what do you think about the role of the Catholic Church in, in Ireland? Because um, Ireland is a very Catholic um, country as well, or has uh, Catholicism plays a big role, as, as I've read. Um, what do you think is, uh, is different um, in Ireland compared to Poland? Yeah, like I can, it's very similar what happened here, like when you were talking about LGBT rights, like, like that was illegal for years as well. And we only, I think this, it was 
when we had the referendum for same-sex ma marriage like that was that was a, that was a difficult campaign as well like um you had them saying you know everyone deserves a home mother and a dad like it was just such silly arguments um and you know we didn't have contraception for years we didn't have divorce like Ireland has been was such a backwards place um religion is tied in with everything in schools and when you're kind of in a school like that you're thinking like that it, like as you grow up it's kind of then older people start thinking like that and um, so I think now like we need to have complete secular you know from schools and from the government um, as well and I think like I don't know but the Catholic Church seems to have gotten less important now um, because I think all this like devastating stuff that happened like I'm not sure if you know about like the mother and baby homes and what they, they would have treated women really badly if they were pregnant years and years ago to put them in homes and treat them really bad and I think when evidence came out about that people were very shocked and like couldn't they couldn't believe it really happened and these women would, would start speaking up because for years like you couldn't say anything bad and there was a way to be and you know um so I think as as time has moved on and you know when we got the same-sex mar marriage and you know people it was just like such a social change that happened here I think um but like I just I think even me growing up like I've never um, wanted to be you know religious or, or something like that but I think as I said before by choice like we didn't really even have a choice growing up you're just like you're you're in with the church and that's it you know you don't really know any different um which is a problem because when I have when you do have other people in Ireland that haven't been religious it's even, it's almost strange you know um because we've been growing up with that for so long and uh, with the abortion rights uh, the Catholic Church where was there and they were kind of like um, it's against Catholicism and things like that um, so yeah it was it was hard like you had people campaigning outside churches as you go in and I think it was like a way to even almost make you feel bad you know um, but I think that's how it ended up changing is literally time moving on and um, I just hope that even in Poland, you know, it's just difficult with the government there. I feel like <clears throat> because Sinn Féin was there and we were literally shouting at the government and uh, made made like a huge difference, you know. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so you've mentioned that um, the reputation of the Catholic Church has been hurt by um, different uh, yeah, violent situations coming up. Um, um, I think I've read something about abuse, uh, sexual abuse within the um, Catholic Church as well. Um, Emma, do you think, um, are, are there similar discussions in Poland as well? Because here in Germany, um, there have been discussions about the sexual abuse in the um, Catholic Church um, that have hurt the reputation of the Catholic Church he here as well, especially in Cologne. Um, is there a similar debate going on in Poland? Yeah, there has been a, a similar debate going on in Poland for years. After just also uh, as an Ireland uh, in Poland, there has also been a, a, a lot more speaking up about what the Catholic Church did to children. A lot of now adults are speaking up about what happened to them as children, about the sexual abuse. Uh, about the molestation, about um, uh, about uh, things that, that has happened to hundreds of, of children, and what has hurt the um, uh, it has hurt the Catholic Church, uh, the reputation, especially since the priests, the bishops that have done these sick things. Uh, aren't really put to justice in Poland. Most of the time when, uh, for example, a priest, a priest uh, in court has been shown to have molested kids, 
isn't from the prison, but except for that, he has moved to another church maybe a few hours back, a few hours to a different city, to a different church, uh, to a different commonwealth. commonwealth. Um, that has sparked a lot of debate in Poland about the Catholic Church, uh, about their privileges as people. If, um, if a citizen would have been uh, molesting a child, he would have been thrown to prison, prison almost immediately. But when it's a bishop, when it's a priest, um, most of the time they aren't really put uh, into um, legal action. They are just moved from place to place. Sometimes uh, when the priest is moved uh, to a different city, to a different church, he does it again and then moved to another church and another church. Sometimes the most brutal things uh, that the church could have done to a priest that has done sick things like that could have just firing them from the position of priest. And then again, nothing else. Um, the thing that has brought those things to attention in Poland uh, was um, two brothers, two, um, two um, reporters who have made right now two movies about the molestation in the Catholic Church. Uh, I really suggest you watch it. I believe um, sub English subtitles are available. Um, one of those movies are Zabawa Chowanego, which is uh, Hide and Seek. Uh, I really recommend them. It shows uh, personal stories of now adult people who have been hurt by the church and are searching for the people that hurt them that are still just walking freely on the streets. Uh, so similarly to Germany and Ireland, um, the discussion about the reputation of the Catholic Church is also going on. Uh, and the reputation of the Catholic Church was hurt because of the scandals. Um, I am pretty sure that um, if those uh, if those stories wouldn't have gone to light, maybe the discussion about the Catholic Church would have been I believe that Emma is experiencing some diff um, technical difficulties um, due to the internet connection. Um, so why don't we move on? Oh, Emma, okay, so you're here again. Um, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. Do you want to finish your statement? Uh, no, no, I am finished. Okay, could you just repeat the last sentence because there have been, uh, there's been some interruption, unfortunately. Oh, uh, what did you lose me on? Uh, just the last few seconds, really. Oh, uh... So I believe that if these stories didn't come to light, then I believe that the discussion about the Catholic Church would, uh, wouldn't be the same right now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so you mentioned that um, the uh, further restriction of abortion rights has sparked um, huge protests. Um, who are these people protesting? Can you tell us something about them? Uh, when it comes to people protesting, there was a lot of variety. Young and old, uh, women, men, uh, just anyone you could imagine was on these protests. Even people that I met before that aren't necessarily very uh, progressive still uh, supported a woman's right to abortion. Um, after months of the government just pissing us off, we wanted to show them that we are, you know, we are people and uh, we uh, won't put up with the things that the government is doing, uh, along with the flags of the Polish strike, uh, also hung the flags of the LGBTQ community, uh, the flags of political parties, the flags of 
so so many communities that were standing uh, hand to hand, shoulder to shoulder with Polish women. Um, there were people over 80 year, years old and people um, five years old with their parents. Uh, it was the most people that I have ever seen on the street uh, in my life when when I held a protest in my uh, city, my city is around 40,000 people. Um, on the biggest days, over a thousand people came, uh, mostly young women, but also men, police officers. I even saw a priest there with us. <laughs> so uh, um, also in cities near me, in the capital of the Lower Carpathia region, Rzeszów, over a few thousand people, young and old. When I stood there with the microphone, I thought that I thought that that fight is worth fighting for, especially with so many good people, and that when you are fighting for women's rights, you aren't fighting alone. Over 70% of people in Poland support the right to abortion. Uh, if we had the same political situation um, when it comes to referendums in like Switzerland or Ireland, I believe we would have passed uh, legal abortion by now. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, our political system isn't like that. Uh, but we can still fight to pass legislation and to bring um, a message to politicians that banning abortion isn't what we want. We want freedom and uh, we will fight for it, just as our parents did in the 80s for freedom under communism. Thank you, Emma. So uh, you've mentioned that the protests have been led by a variety of different people. Um, what was the uh, campaigning in Ireland like, Kelly? What, was it uh, also very uh, broad or um, could you see different uh, groups of society prominently participating? Yeah, there was a whole... Um, people people all came together during this you know it was actually really really good to see um, and we had a campaign slogan like my body my choice um, a lot of um, it was literally people on the ground that did this you know that's what um, they were saying in Poland like it's it's like women that there used to be so less people there and then it just became absolutely huge like there was there was marches every weekend then um, you know you know, Sinn Féin was was at the forefront of that for a long time. Um, before before the government was, you know, they kind of were like, they, you know, they what they did was they seen what people's views was, and then they were like, oh, okay, you know. Um, so I think because the people were on the ground screaming, it made them go, okay, we need a referendum, you know. Um, and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, here. Um, but that took a long time. Like I, I really thought this was going to take longer. Like that's what I would even say to the people. Like for Poland, like keep go, like keep going at it because they actually can't keep this going. Like because you know, women are gonna always need reproductive rights, and I, I like I still don't think it is as good as it should be here as well. Um, you know, because as soon as it like we repeal the eighth here in the Republic, we went up north to march there. Um, and yeah, like that's, and it, it, like it, it literally was, I think groups of people would go go and like, I don't know how did they do it in, over there, but go along people's doors and things like that. Um, and, you know, you were listening then to the other opposition that was also campaigning. Um, so I suppose at the time, like we didn't really know what way it was going to because I, I think it took such a long time before um but yeah yeah that was mainly it anyway oh, that's very interesting um and I remember being there uh during uh, your campaign in Ireland uh, and I was able to see uh, uh one of your protests and in, uh, in Monaghan uh, it's very very nice to see that um what do you think um has international um support 
played a role uh, in um, the campaign or um, do you think it could help? I think like if, especially for Poland, like if you look at such a Catholic country like Ireland, I think if that can help, like I would love to help over there because I know like we know what it's like here and what happened. Um, and I think, I think it was, I suppose, getting support from other people was like always, you know, other left wing parties, especially was always like important. Um, and like without them, we needed as much help as we could get, you know. And uh, in what ways did you have international support that you would think um, might um, be useful to Poland as well? or? Uh, maybe to you, maybe Emma, you can answer as well. Um, what, what kind of international support would you uh, wish for uh, to help your campaign? I was just like thinking, like if I'm looking at reproductive rights here, like if, like even there was like a cervical check scandal here in Ireland too. Like like health, women's reproductive health is actually really really bad here, um, still and. I was even thinking, you know, a woman's reproductive rights, like someone in the government to just deal with that because it's so bad. Like the health in Ireland from the government is really bad anyway. And this, I suppose, woman is just like the la like left there as well. And um, so I think if you had, you know, even a a policy like our own left wing policy for, you know, the likes of Ireland and Poland and other countries that are on the same left-wing movement that would be really helpful thank you emma what do you think what kind of international support um could um, the polish campaign for reproductive rights um really use well we've already had a lot of support internationally when the first protests were being held in autumn um but uh, always uh, people need to just talk about it, bring, uh, bring information about what's happening in Poland for women's rights, reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights. Uh, when uh, such laws that the ruling party is trying to pass are going, for example, through the parliament, um, the, the EU, uh, for example, speaks up about it. Um, but there isn't much that the EU can do except speak about it. Uh, but I think that what we need is support of um, organizations and in, of people that are um, for reproductive rights, uh, that are for women's rights. And uh, we just need, um, we just need uh, to be able to have a lot of um, uh, to have a platform to speak about what's happening in Poland, um, to just bring awareness about what's happening. Um, I believe that that's the most important thing to bring awareness and to search, for example, in the Euro European Union uh, for help uh, to sort of bring the ruling party um, to bring the ruling party to explain why is this happening, why are they doing this, and to sort of um, just as they are doing right now with Hungary, that if they uh, the EU is starting to um, take action to countries that are um, that are um, breaking fundamental human rights in their countries, for example, with Hungary with the um, non-free press or anti-LGBTQ uh, rights, the same in Poland, which is also very oppressive towards um, women, towards, um, to, towards their rights to their bodies and uh, LGBTQ people. Um, we just kind of need someone to um, hold uh, the, um, ruling party accountable and during the protest mm, during the protests who are holding uh, the um, ruling party accountable so many people on the streets uh, are can be really frightening for them um, 
And when the European Union uh, talks about what's happening in Poland, it also frightens them because they cannot count on that much support, on money, on uh, sanctions. So um, the ruling party thinks it's um, out of any critique. So we just need someone to hold them accountable that has power. People can frighten them in Poland, but they do not have that much power as the, for example, EU has. Thank you, Emma. Um, so originally we wanted to have another expert from Argentina on this panel. Um, her name is Laura from, uh, she's a um, pro-choice activist um, from Argentina. And um, there is this uh, a very interesting thing. Um, it's, it's a common belief in Argentina that the higher the economic status of a pregnant woman, a uh, woman, um, the easier it is for her to get a safe abortion, while poorer women often cannot afford um, the procedure under sanitary conditions or uh, cannot afford po uh, post-abortion care. Um, Kali, do you think this is a problem in Ireland too? Or do you think that um, the economic status of um, the uh, pregnant woman is um, plays a role at all? Yeah, that was actually when I was looking at, um, if you look at like uh, facts on who get actually gets abortion or who was trying to and couldn't, it was always people that um, had like little, little or no money couldn't go and travel. Cause like, how can you, you know, how could you go over and travel to England? And that was the problem with, I, I suppose, different laws that they did bring in before appealing the eighth that didn't work because there was people there that just couldn't afford to do it. And like, obviously the government here then wasn't thinking of, of anyone like that. Um, so that, that, that Argentinian is definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you've also mentioned that many um, doctors who uh, could perform an abortion, refuse to do so. Um, here in Germany, we have a similar situation. So no um, doctor can be made to perform an abortion if he or she doesn't want to. Um, but uh, is, it, is the information of who can, uh, like who, who uh, which doctors are available for performing this procedure? Um, is that information freely available? Like you literally have to search it yourself. It's not accessible easily, you know? Like I think it's easy in colleges maybe now, just because, um, Oh, I think uh, Kelly has some technical difficulties. Um, Emma, what about Poland? Is the information of um, who can or where you can get an abortion, um, is it freely avail uh, available in Poland or is it very difficult um, to obtain this information. Just as Kelly said, for us it's also very hard to know. Um, there isn't any available information about um, what the doctor uh, can perform an abortion uh, or will perform an abortion. Uh, one problem is that we do not have a lot of abortion clinics, uh, doctors who are willing to perform an abortion. Um, which um, brings the problem of the accessibility of an abortion. Let's say that the woman has, um, let's say that a woman uh, is pregnant and can have an abortion by law, but still cannot ha have one because uh, in her region, there isn't one abortion clinic or in the clinic, the doctor doesn't want to perform the abortion. Um, so it um, stands a lot of uh, the economic status of the woman. If she has a lot of money, she can go to Germany, to Slovakia to perform an abortion. But if a woman is poor and cannot perform an abortion outside of the country, uh, the only thing, thing she has left is the abortion underground, which is which isn't a very safe place to have an abortion in. Uh, many women have died during, during these procedures and it isn't safe. And even if it, if it is successful, then uh, miscarriages and abortions 
are um, investigated by the police and then a woman can go to uh, jail for killing uh, their child, uh, which, which is horrible. And uh, yeah, it stands a lot of the uh, economic status of the woman. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have uh, right now um, organizations for women that, um, for example, can provide um, legal and financial help to have an abortion outside of Poland, in Germany, in the UK, in Slovakia and Czechia. Uh, or to provide them pills that can perform, perform an at-home abortion uh, for, um, I believe, 10 weeks after being pregnant. Um, but still, it's a very risky game uh, to perform an abortion in Poland or even outside of Poland when you are uh, a Polish citizen. And um, these organizations that help women in need, um, are they restricted in any way by the government or um, I could imagine that it's very difficult? One of the problems is um, they are, um, they have a lot of problems legally. And they are being a lot by pro-life activists, by, uh, um, yeah, mostly by pro-life, um, by pro-life and fundamentalistic uh, organizations like Ordo Yogis um, that um, not only want to uh, ban abortion overall, they want to withdraw um, um, the Istanbul Convention, um, these organizations are suing um, organizations that help women. And the second problem is that these organizations don't have a lot of funding. Uh, they mostly rely on um, gifts, on uh, sometimes women that perform an abortion with them can just give a small amount of money to help them. Because, um, you know, having an abortion, for example, in Germany, plus the stay for one or two nights, the, it costs a lot of money. Um, so the two problems mostly is legal action and financial and financial action. Um, women who um, go uh, to help uh, in these organizations mostly don't have a pretty good uh, financial financial situation so they just cannot give as much money as the organization needs to perform still uh, try to help as many people as possible to uh, reach um, their rights whether it is in poland or uh, outside of poland Thank you, Emma. Um, so regarding the uh, method of uh, abortions in different countries, I know that in um, Ireland, um, abortion pills played a, played a big role. Um, and then that has also um, played a big part in the discussion um, and in the debate uh, regarding the upcoming uh, referendum on repealing the eighth. Um, Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about that, um, like about the abortion pills and um, what um, what role they're playing? Yeah, they were huge. Like people would, especially people like um, that you know couldn't afford to travel to England. They were going over uh, the border to the north for these abortion pills, and it was extremely dangerous. You know, they were getting these pills and they were going home, and you know they could have died really taking them. Um, didn't really know where they got them and um, like it was <clears throat> it was a really dangerous time for people for women in Ireland um, and you know no you know they didn't know what else to do and that seemed like the best option you know um, and I think like I think see like people hearing that women are doing this anyway um, in 
in a way that's going to damage our health was a way that people did this and, um, to repeal the Eighth Amendment as well. Yeah, um, it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a bit, a bit more about how abortion and uh, rights and reproductive rights can be won because uh, I mean, your campaign in Ireland did the impossible, uh, and uh, even though um, abortions are still um, restricted in some way, um, it has been a huge win um, for um, women across Ireland. Um, so, it's, of course, it's very interesting. How can we um, achieve the same goal in um, different in different countries? And I've read about um, the uh, no campaign being very toxic, and that that has also played a role or played a part in um, turning the public opinion around. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think they were basically saying that women were killing children or babies, you know, things like <clears throat> things that you can't, don't make any sense, you know, um, and that's when people were like, this is actually quite crazy. And a lot of them people then, um, I thought it was kind of interesting, like a lot of people from the north that were very religious um would come, like that wouldn't, they would, you know, be up, they would be up north and they would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm separate from, uh, I'm separate from this whole entire island. But yes, when there was the repeal going on, they were coming down here then and going, oh, we can't have abortion here. And I was like, that's a, uh, that's ridiculous. Um, and I was getting so, like, I tried not to, but you know, you're getting so angry. Um, and then you're trying to be like calm and listening to them too, because you kind of, you obviously had to, you know. Um, but some things didn't, they were just, no, didn't make any sense. And like, I think, the cho like if you're pushing a woman's choice like, it, like just because you know you're pregnant doesn't mean you're going to have an abortion you know even there's so many different circumstances that you could be in and I think that's what a lot of women didn't have and I think now like I still don't think there's a, like I don't know what it is there's just I hate that stigma around it I suppose that you still have towards towards w women's health um you know and it's it's I don't know I don't know how you get around that like to to build on like more um but I think you're right like even talking about it now and Ireland still being in a discussion like this just because we repeal that you know that still needs to be talked about yeah so this um Toxic no campaign has definitely helped, but um, how did you, um, how did the uh, repeal campaign um, manage to uh, get people to um, make themselves a picture of um, the, the situation? How did you achieve that? Yeah, that was what I was saying there. I think the choice in the matter was, was huge. You know, it wasn't saying that, you know, do you not trust women? I think that was a huge thing as well. Trusting in women, do you not? trust in them to make a choice that's going to be right for them. And I think that was a huge thing that made, I don't know, so especially for the likes of men that maybe didn't want to comment or listen about this type of thing. And it was easier for them to understand that as well. Um, you know, sometimes it was a bit awkward, you know, campaigning uh, towards those people. And I think with older people as well, it was actually quite difficult because they would have grown up very uh, Catholic. And, you know, the likes of even my family, my older members of my family, they were still like, you know, when I talked to them about it, about the choice and what happened to people and people are dying and things like that, it was easy to say, oh, but do you not think in these circumstances or like, you know, and then they kind of turned, like they kind of started saying, oh, well, I wouldn't do it, but I guess they can if they have the choice, you know. Yeah, and that's a very interesting point you've mentioned talking about this topic with your family um because i've read that um the campaign was also driven by young women um within their families and their environment so um do you think this um very uh personal form of communication like put it, taking this topic into your own environment and into your own family and making it a topic do you think that's um has played a, a large role I think it was massive, definitely. Um, you know, but then you also had other people that were against it, you know, saying, oh, 
you know, if I had this abortion, if I had this abortion, I wouldn't have had you or whatever, you know, and I was like, that is the choice you made, you know, like that, that's, that, that's, that was the understanding that you have to then go around it with, like when I, when I remember doing it. And I think even it was, I think it made it easier um, with the same sex marriage that passed before it, because when you were talking to people about that, um, they understood, they understood that there was the change already, if you know. Um, so because talking about this, these different social issues that you never would have ever discussed here in Ireland, you know, especially with your older family members, I think that made it easier. And it's funny though, because like if if there was if they had a member of the LGBT community in their family, they understand that more, you know. Um, so if they if they've been affected by something, it's it is easier to to make them understand about other people's issues as well. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so Emma, do you think that could be a successful strategy um, in Poland as well, that um, especially young women make it a topic in their family and kind of uh, bring this topic into their personal environment? Yes, I think that um, most of the change um, in families, uh, just personal uh, for people, is mostly affected by the people around them. Mm, uh, it's in Poland, it's not the problem with uh, the people, uh, because as I said before, most of the people are for legal abortion or uh, just staying with the um, mm, compromise in Poland. Uh, but still, when um, after the protests, after the, uh, the ruling party wanted to withdraw the compromise, then um, the people that are for legal abortion that have been affected by the protests, by their daughters, sisters and wives going to the protests, I believe that um, the ruling party in the next elections uh, won't necessarily um, have that sort of strength in their um, voters. Uh, because I have talked to and seen on the protests many people that have voted for peace um, more than once, uh, but still aren't very happy with the decision they made um, with reproductive rights. So with the rise of um, young people uh, being more left-wing, uh, and uh, the people who have voted for the ruling party uh, kind of being sick of, um, of the things that the ruling party is doing, I believe that in the next election, we will see a change uh, in uh, the ruling party. Uh, and uh, when it's not peace, and if it's a different party, then uh, they will look at the topic of abortion differently that the ruling party is now because um, they will have learned that messing with human rights and messing with women's rights uh, isn't a good fight that uh, people will go on the streets again people will fight for the rights again and more progressive politicians more young politicians are um, going into Polish higher politics, uh, then it will be, uh, I believe that um, the fight that are, we are fighting right now uh, is just starting, but we are every year getting closer to having um, better accessible abortions, to having a better reproductive health. And I believe that in a few years, we, could, we can look at ourselves and say that we are at the same place that, for example, Ireland is now at. So I, I really hope so. And I wish that uh, we could have, have had that change um, years ago. But um, political change in Poland is happening very fast. Just 30 years ago, after the fall of communism, um, and now, um, with our far-right government, 
uh, I believe that in a few years when people my age will gain um, political rights uh, to vote, then um, our fight uh, will be easier in higher policies, in higher politics. So I think that uh, I think that we won't have to wait long to um, to legalize abortion, to be more free with our bodies, and to for Poland to be less of a fundamentalistic Catholic driven uh, country. Thank you, Emma. And um, so you think that um, the topic of a reproductive rights is going to be um, a big one in the next election? I believe so. It already is a very big topic. Um, the parliamental election will be held in two years uh, and the next presidential election in four, four years. So um, when uh, my generation will have voting rights, uh, then politicians wanting to have the vote of young people will uh, want to listen to young people, to what they uh, have in mind when they are talking about a progressive country. So I believe that um, in the next election, let's say the parliamental election in two years, um, we will have a lot more parties and a lot more politicians willing to represent um, pro-choice movements and pro-choice policies to vote for them in the Polish parliament. Um, so you've also mentioned that um, uh, in a uh, contrary to Ireland, you can't just have a referendum because uh, I mean, sadly so, because you would be probably very succe uh, successful um, in that uh, em em referendum. Um, so what is um, the strategy of the current um, pro-choice campaign in Ireland of the um, black protests? I'm sorry, is Kelly supposed to speak now or? Oh no, you, um, I, was, I was asking you. Ah, all right. Um, well, as you said, we can really bring a change uh, through or referendums or political system doesn't work that way. But, um, well, um, after the protests, a lot uh, of change needs to happen in higher politics. Uh, because of the protests, politicians uh, have seen that Fighting against women's rights is not a good game to play. Um, so um, I believe that the thing we need to do uh, as pro-choice activists, politicians, or uh, anyone who wants to fight for women's rights is to educate. Uh, education is very important for our fight in Poland because there is still a lot of stigma and misinformation about uh, what we are trying to fight for. Um, so the fight from the streets goes right now to panels like these or debates um, or local debates, um, TV stations that are holding debates about uh, abortion laws um, with our current political system there isn't much we can do to actually change the policy because we need to have power to change the policy to have to change the policy we need to be in the parliament in the senate uh, of course we are going a long way here progressive parties that want to put uh, uh, they want to legalize abortion to uh, bring sex ed to schools for example, the left party uh, right now has over 
40 people in the parliament, which holds 460 uh, uh, places, uh, and two people in the Senate. Uh, so we have uh, we have tried to pass legislation to legalize abortion, to bring sex ed to school, but of course with many right-wing, far-right-wing or center-right parties in the parliament, uh, it's been very hard to pass that. Even when it could have been passed through the uh, parliament, then it must go through the Senate and then the president must sign uh, the um, the legislation, who of course isn't the ideal president. Uh, I, Andrzej Duda has been known also for, for his uh, far right views, uh, building his campaign on his presidential campaign in 2020 on hate towards the LGBTQ community, for example. So I believe that most of the change will happen after the next election, when we will have more power, uh, when um, pro-choice movement will have more power in the parliament, in the media, in, uh, in higher politics that we can make actual change in. Um, and of course, uh, people who aren't necessarily into politics just need to speak up locally about uh, the pro-choice movement either helping women get get abortions or get uh, reproductive uh, health things. So yeah, um, unfortunately, we cannot have just held a referendum, uh, but um, there is uh, a lot of way there are a lot of ways that we can uh, change the policy. And I believe that it will happen in the next election or so. Well, let's hope that. Um, you previously mentioned that um, you live in a, a very conservative area. Um, and um, if we look at Ireland, um, especially people living in the cities and in urban areas voted um, with, yes, do, how is the situation in Poland? Is the fight for reproductive rights, are the protests more centralized or are they happening in um, rural areas as well? When it comes to the protests, it has absolutely uh, um, no meaning where uh, the protests have been held. Uh, the protests were held basically everywhere, um, from the capital and bigger cities to uh, very, very small cities and uh, villages even. So uh, even if the protest is held by 10 people or uh, a thousand, it still shows that everywhere there are people who want to fight for their basic human rights. My city where I have held protests is a very small and very um, uh, and very right-wing city, but still um, there were a lot of people on the protests, a lot of people attending them, making them. Uh, just it was uh, at first I thought the same that uh, no that. Uh, in my city, there wouldn't be a lot of people, but that. <laughs> but after I saw that many people under my protest, um, it changed my mind drastically. Everywhere, uh, people have protested, and um, the smaller the city, the more people came to the protests. Um, so no, um, the fight is going on everywhere, even. Uh, Strike Kobiet was uh, holding protests outside of Poland. I believe there were a few in Germany, in Switzerland, uh, in the United States, I think. So no matter the, the location, the protests were held and the protests were big. I'm very glad to hear that. Um... So let's look at the Irish um, campaign again. Kelly, how did the Irish campaign manage to um, get through to rural areas as well? Yeah, I think um, before when we had the same-sex marriage, because that was campaigned in the rural, rural 
areas as well that actually helped us campaign then in them rural areas um also and it's funny because like i was the same as emma i was like oh you're never going to get those kind of rural areas to change or anything but i think it, it wasn't really even a, a point of matter where you were actually from in that campaign like if you're a woman you're going to be affected by that and like there was a lot of women you know in rural areas that had to get abortions or you know the were using the pill as well um and it, yeah it was it was it was amazing that we got like there was only one county out of the 26 that that it actually didn't get voted in by yeah that's definitely amazing and i've also read that um especially uh, members of the lgbtq community and um, especially young women voted with yes um but how did you get through to um the other people and do you think um that that has been like these these young people who've been who are a um member of the lgbtq community and also of the um of the younger um community um do you think they were like a um like a how do you say a, a motor a driver of this um debate and of this campaign yeah i think they were but like you if you actually look at even there was women that was women affected by this like in the 80s that were campaigning then and these women were now older and they would get through to like the women that were older than us as well so like it wasn't act, like it wasn't actually just that like that did change things as well having younger people but I think it was sad when you were looking at these women that had no choice back then and you know they went campaigning years ago and it was a much difficult time to do it in back then um and they definitely helped and they changed and you know what helped as well we were listening to people's stories as well that were affected by the eight amendment and they became very you know they were everywhere and it was really really sad like that i think the campaign became very emotional and personal to people as well and i think that helped win it you know so your focus on personal stories and on emotion uh, on emotions um, has been very successful for you for you and has reached uh, a broad variety of people yeah like that, especially them stories like even you know we were already going to vote yes but even us listening to that was just, it just made it worse you know we were getting then more mad at, at the situation um, and it was just horrible that we had to we had to like I had to get that bad you know to listen to that yeah, that actually reminds me of the situation in Argentina, um, where the feminist movement has been demanding reproductive rights since the 1970s, um, but have been, uh, yeah, have not been listened to for a very long time. Um, and it also reminds me of what Emma said um, just um, a few minutes ago, uh, where you said that um, the uh, Senate has to be uh, in favour of of the new law of the new abortion law as well um because argentina also had the situation where the um a president and the national congress um have actually uh, submitted uh, an abortion um legislation bill but it was denied by the senate uh, and now just recently in december 2020 they have gained um more uh, reproductive rights um, but um, if we look at Argentina, it has been a very long fight. Um, the campaign there has submitted um, the uh, new abortion legislation bill to the National Congress every year since 2007. Um, and it makes you think, uh, does, do you grow at all tired of um, fighting, um, Emma, or do you think that um, the movement is still very energetic and uh, full of life? Um, I believe that it's still very full of life. Of course, the um, protests have died down a little, um, mostly because the law has been already passed. But um, still, there is a huge fight still going on, mostly online, um, because we are in the age of the pandemic. 
uh, and um, the movement has also went to mainstream media and mainstream politics. So um, when it comes to um, the fight, then uh, we are still being talked about. We are, we are still being uh, invited to um, debates, to uh, experts who want to hear about the fight. For example, I was invited a few weeks ago um, to a TV station that wanted to talk about the fight for human rights and women's rights in Poland. Um, so I believe that right now there's a big campaign going on in the media uh, from uh, Strike Kobiet. And yeah, um, so I believe that maybe we aren't as active in the protests, but um, more active members are still fighting um, uh, locally or in, on the internet, in the media, uh, wherever they can. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, we're slowly reaching uh, the end of the seminar. Do you have any um, closing remarks for us or um, like some last uh, advice that you would like to share with the uh, people who are currently fighting for reproductive rights all over the world? Um, maybe, Kelly, if you want to go first. Oh, I was just thinking like, like it will happen, it has to happen. You can't just, you know, have women not having our rights like and I know it's like I remember I didn't even think it was going to happen like when it did for us and I think if you just keep going at the government it will happen like they have to listen and I actually see like I seen the protests in Poland they were huge like and the signs and everything like that's exactly what what it was like here and I think we will like we're still like going to be fighting here for like things that are still wrong with women's health and but I get like it's going to happen it just will so just keep going or definitely yeah for people who are fighting all over the globe then keep fighting and keep doing uh, what you need to do uh, especially to young people young women who are fighting you are the future um, there's no denying that you are the future of your country and if you do not fight now then what will you say to your kids in 30 years so if we keep fighting if we keep being determined that yes change will happen sooner or later then we will win and I hope that everyone at home that is watching this um, is determined to have real change made in their country, in their local community. So I just hope that everybody can fight freely and everybody and everybody's fight will bring, um, will bring a better future for their country. Well, thank you so much. So just to sum it up, we've talked about the um, role of the Catholic Church, which does play a big role in different uh, in, in many different countries regarding reproductive rights. We've talked about um, keep, to keep going and to stay strong um, to have, um, as we say in Germany, a long breath in this fight. Um, and uh, also about the involvement of um, the LGBTQ community uh, in this fight that um, how a, a queer fights and uh, feminist fights are very interlinked with each other, um, how uh, it has been very successful in Ireland to make it um, a, ver a, a very personal matter and um, to keep debating this uh, in your personal environment um, as well as on the streets in protests. Um, and uh, we have already seen this uh, change happening in uh, Poland as we have in Ireland. Um, so we know that it's definitely um, a cause worth fighting for. Yeah, um, thank you very much um, for to you, Kelly and Emma, um, for participating uh, today in uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. It has been very informative. And um, yeah, I think I'm sure that it's giving, uh, it's given a lot of people hope 
uh, to continue this very important um, fight in their country. And also thank you to all the listeners out there who uh, stuck with us uh, during the seminar. And um, yeah, I hope you liked it. And uh, I hope that we will see each other again soon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you to the interpreters as well. Yeah, thank you so much, guys.